Okay, it's time for question time, and uh, I have to inform the House that uh, question number uh, seven has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Sam Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Question one. Free school meals ensure that pupils here from families that are most in need have access to a healthy and nutritious cooked meal during the day. A free meal also provides support to low-income families who have faced financial barriers when their children are seeking to access and remain in school. The focus of my policy on free school meals is to ensure that they are targeted at those children from families who are most in need. In recent years, I have extended the eligibility criteria to include not only those families with no income, but also those working families on benefits and low incomes. This resulted in over 34,000 pupils becoming eligible for free school meals in 2014-15. In 14-15, nearly 98,000 children, which represents approximately 30 per cent of the school population, benefited from the current policy on free school meals. This cost the Department of Education approximately £40 million. Pounds. In the current difficult financial climate, I have therefore no plans to further extend school meals to all younger children. Uh, irrespective of need. Call Mr. Gardner for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. But does the Minister agree with the recent report from the BMA, which recommends that schools in Northern Ireland uh, start offering free school meals to all pupils from the age of four to seven? Well, I certainly think it would be the ideal position to be in, but unfortunately, we do not have the finances to follow up on the BMA report and previous decisions made uh, in England in relation to free school meals entitlement and the born and consequences which flowed from that to the executive. The executive made a decision to uh, use that money in various departments, including in health. And I'm, I'm not arguing against that decision, but uh, as every member in the chamber knows, health is also facing significant pressures. But yes, I would like to be in the ideal position where we provide free school meals uh, to all children, but we currently don't have the finances to back that up. Call Ms. Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can the Minister outline what steps have been taken to promote uptake and ensure that all children who are eligible are actually accessing and availing of their nutritious school meal? Um, well, I have issued several statements uh, in relation to this over the summer to encourage parents who are eligible to, for their children for free school meals to uptake in this. There is information distributed through the schools, and there will be a regular, as you member will be aware, there's also regular discussions in the media and elsewhere in relation to free school meals and several other items in relation to free school meals entitlement. And it's important to point out to parents that there's no stigma attached to your child receiving free school meals. It is an entitlement. There is no stigma attached in the school, as there's no longer the case where, where children on free school meals will have a different coloured ticket or a different coloured pass. Or it may, in many, many schools now, uh, there is processes in place which no one knows who is paying or who is not paying directly uh, for, for school meals within the school. So I would encourage every parent to ensure that their children are receiving all the entitlements they're entitled to within our schools in terms of free school meals entitlement, and reassure every parent out there that there is no stigma attached to free school meals. Well, Ms. Sandra Overend. Question number two, please. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer question two and thirteen together. Uh, there continues to be a very strong performance by pupils here at both GCSE and A levels, and it's important that we celebrate and acknowledge their achievements across the north. We should not forget that the teachers and parents who have supported these children to reach this stage in their education. In relation to GCSEs, there was an increase in A star grade from 8.9% to 9%. Grades A star to A also show an increase to 28.6%. Grades A star to C increased to 78.7%. In relation to A levels, 83% of entries at A levels here reached grades A star to C. The overall pass rate remained much the same as last year, rising slightly to 98.2% of grades awarded A star to E. 7.6, previously 7.3 of grades were awarded at A star. One of my top priorities as Education Minister continues to be raising standards. I am particularly pleased that we are seeing improvements in two key areas. 
the performances of young men at GCSE level on the upward trends seen in proportion of entries in STEM subjects, uh, science, technology, engineering and maths at both GCSE and A-levels. These results are very encouraging, but we cannot become complacent. There remains unacceptable achievement gaps at all levels in our system, and I intend to do all that I can to tackle that. Ms. Overend for a supplementary. I uh, thank, the, thank the Minister for his response, uh, and I, I too congratulate all those who uh, received results, uh, students across Northern Ireland, and, uh, and the excellent results uh, that they have, as the Minister has outlined. Um, while, uh, does the Minister agree that whilst it's heartening that Northern Ireland's pupils maintain a healthy lead in terms of achieving grades A star to AC at A level and five or more GCSEs, uh, compared to England and Wales, if we continue to diverge from the rest of the UK in terms of the way these exams are delivered, comparisons will be impossible in a short few years. And does he share my concerns uh, that local pupils may find it harder to gain university places if we do not maintain parity with the rest of the country? Uh, education is a devolved matter, and it is a matter for the various devolved institutions as to how they uh, set forth their education policies. And the member will also be aware that Wales has taken a different decision from that of Westminster, and Scotland has a completely different exam system again. But it has not proven impossible for young people from Scotland to travel to England and back and forth over many, many generations. It certainly hasn't proved impossible for young people to travel from uh, Southern Ireland to England and vice versa in relation to university, employment, etc and their grades recognised. And indeed, many universities in Britain take students from across the globe, and they're perfectly capable of comparing international exams uh, to their local exams. So I have no concerns in relation to ensuring that our young people will have portable, respected qualifications moving forward. I have not taken any decision in relation to the exams we currently hold without first establishing an expert group on the matter allowing them to consult and report back to me. And I have accepted every recommendation that expert group has brought forward. So I have taken my time in relation to any changes proposed to our exam system. I have listened to the experts in the field. I have consulted. And I won't make any further changes unless I do the same program again. But we shouldn't be sending out any stories from the chamber or concerns from the chamber that our young people's qualifications will not be valid and values across these islands. In relation to comparisons, while it's useful to compare to England and Wales, what we have to ensure now is that our young people are compared against the international best standards. And that's where we have to set our targets. Uh, so certainly I always ensure and, and monitor our comparisons with England and Wales, but I'm more interested, and it's nothing to do with politics with a small P or a capital P. I'm more interested as to how our young people are comparing with the international uh, education uh, field than I am in it's any small geographical network. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much. Deputy Speaker, and, uh, arising out of the Minister's answer uh, to Mrs. Overend, could I ask the Minister to outline any trends there might be in relation to students here in Northern Ireland undertaking uh, GCSEs or A-levels uh, 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 under the English or the Welsh uh, uh, educational authorities? Uh, we operate here an open market in terms of our qualification system. Now, the vast majority of qualifications uh, in our schools are fall under the CA remit, but there is an international or a, a, a market there, and the Welsh and English examination boards do operate here. I have met them, I have had discussions with them, and also my officials have had uh, discussions with them as well. And my, my message to them is clear. I am prepared to keep an open market as long as their examinations do not corrupt our curriculum. And they understand my position, I understand theirs, and we continue to monitor that, that, that situation. So as long as there's no corruption of, of, of our curriculum, I am more than happy to keep an open market running at this time. Call Ms. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three, Minister. The Department is currently considering if the Manhattan database, which is used by the Education Authority for estate management purposes, could be used to provide updated information on capacity of each school. Mr. Kelly, for a supplementary. 
thank you. Um, Minister, in calculating um, school capacity, does the Department use its own figures, that is, designated teaching space, or does uh, it use the Education Library Board figures, which includes space which has the potential uh, for dual use, such as uh, assembly halls? We use uh, our own figures, and this has been the subject of a discussion within a recent Audit Office report, and I'm aware that the Audit Office report is before the Public Accounts Committee in November, and I think the Chair of the Public Accounts Committee is sitting behind me, so I have no words to uh, um, preempt whatever will happen in relation to the Public Accounts Committee's inquiry and then the forthcoming report from the other recommendations they make. But at this stage, I'm aware there is the old boards used to use the Manhattan system, now the Education Authority uses the Manhattan system. My department has another way of measuring uh, teaching space, etc. Et but I believe that in terms of both the Audit Office report, what flows from the Public Accounts Committee, and in my department's own work, we'll be able to merge into the one system. Well, Mr Barney McElduff. Uh, question number four. Uh, the contractual commitments for minor works from the 14-15 financial year, together with a substantial reduction in capital budget from 15-16 onwards, means that the capital budget for 15-16 is fully committed. I have and will continue to endeavour to relocate funding where possible to minor works and to bid for additional funding at each monitoring round throughout the year. This is the current position. Later this financial year, I am hoping to be in a position to develop a programme of minor works and to progress the most urgent projects. Should it not be possible to secure additional funding in the 15-16 financial year, then it is anticipated that the highest priority works will be released for delivery in the first half of the 16-17 financial year, subject to budget availability. Mark Duff for a supplementary. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of my strong interest in three schools in the Oma district, uh, which have been lobbying for uh, over the summer months, uh, Dean McGurk College, Carrick Moore, St. Scaria's Primary School, Trillick, and All Saints Primary School, Taddy Sala. Can I ask the Minister if there's any way that the Westminster Government can be persuaded to give his department a workable budget to make sure that schools in Category 1 are able to proceed without delay? Um, well, the member, I am aware of the member's uh, strong lobbying in relation to those schools and a number of other schools in its constituency. And other members in the House have also been raising their, their, their genuine concerns about minor works programmes within the schools' estate in reference to their own constituencies. But the member makes a very valid point. We require a working budget, a budget which is capable of delivering the basic necessities of education. And when the global figures are thrown around in relation to £1.5 billion of cuts to the executive budget over this last number of years. The reality, when it, it comes down to ground level, is that minor works in the schools which he refers to cannot go ahead. Other programmes of work and education cannot go ahead. And there is a responsibility on the British Government to ensure that this executive and the Department of Education has a workable budget. I will just give the members some, from, some figures, and they are quite stark. The, initial, the initial capital budget for education in 15-16 is £147 million, which is significantly below the 14 figure, which was £183.4 million. Due to tight budget constraints, which I have outlined, the total budget currently available for Mine and Works programme in the current financial year is £34 million, compared to 14-15, which was £123 million. So the difference between those two figures means that I can't progress work in the schools you have outlined, and I cannot progress work in other areas uh, and schools which are required. Now, I will continue to work with my executive colleagues, those who are in their executive positions. I will continue to engage with uh, my party and other parties around, around the chamber in terms of ensuring that when we do get talks off the ground, when we do get discussions off the ground, and when parties come into the chamber and come into those talks, that high up on the agenda is a workable budget for all the executive departments in this institution. Mr. Patsy McLaughlin. I got a free last count, colleagues. We have an address and fragment the G Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer up until now. Um, could I ask the Minister, in relation to the schools enhancement uh, scheme, uh, how many of those projects initially 
approved have in fact been completed or are nearing completion? Uh, uh, currently, there's 22 of the original release projects are now in site. I released an additional six schemes in July, and these should be on site by the end of November, bringing the total number of SE schemes to 28. There's a further 11 projects now at pre standard stage, and when budget becomes available, I will release them. And budget can become available in a number of ways. There can be slippage in other spends, and this is what happened in July when I released the six other schemes. There was slippage in spend in a number of other schemes across the capital works programme. I, I, uh, IMA officials and furnished them intervened immediately and ensured that another six projects get off the ground. And if there's slippage in other capital schemes as we move forward, I will release the other 11 projects. And I will also, as I said to Mr. Michael Duff, I will also continue to lobby uh, those executive ministers who are in post and others to ensure that we have a workable budget. Mr. Roy Beggs. Yeah, Principal Deputy Speaker. <coughs> The Minister has commissioned a uh, capital expenditure on a post-primary school for 14 pupils. Uh, rather than those children continue to be educated in specialist Irish language units at existing uh, post-primary post schools, does the Minister not understand that when he spends money in new schools, there is less money available for capital expenditure to maintain the other existing schools with specialist Irish language units? Um, you can cloud your concern around the capital budget around the issues in terms of finance, but what you cannot cloud is the fact that you're not concerned in this instance about the capital budget, you're concerned about Irish medium education and the facilitation of Irish medium education. That is your concern. So why don't you just come out and bluntly say it and say, Minister, I don't like the idea of you providing Irish medium education to young people, I'd rather you stop it. Instead of coming in with this, by the way, Minister, you haven't got a great capital budget, but you try and use it in a different way. Just be straight and honest about the fact and come out and say, Minister, I don't like the fact that you are facilitating Irish medium education. But I will continue, I will continue, I will continue to facilitate Irish medium education. One, because if I start to reduce it to two, do so. And two, because I believe it is the right thing to do. And thirdly, those young people who are benefiting from Irish medium education have a right to have capital funds spent on them. It is not up to you or someone else to decide that because they are taught in the Irish medium sector that we should not provide capital funds and that we should put them, as you refer to, as units, or we should put them somewhere else, we should put them somewhere else. There was a development proposal process went through in relation to College Yara. I approved it. The school is now functioning, and I wish it all the best for the future. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, the department sets admission numbers for schools to determine the number of children they can accept in year one or for post primary school years eight. The department also has the authority to grant additional places in a school by the way of temporary variation to the school's admissions number, which it is for one year only. Temporary variations are used to address short-term demographic pressures in an area and are not about meeting parental preferences for a particular school, permanent increases to schools' admissions, and enrolments can only happen in the context of the overall area plan through the development proposal, proposal process. The member's question as posed requests a significant amount of information and it would not be practical to answer in detail verbally. Therefore, I will arrange for the member to receive this information and for it to be placed in the Assembly Library. Overall, however, I can advise that 90 primary schools were permitted a temporary variation to increase their admissions number for 15-16, while 20 primary schools were refused any increase. For post-primary schools, 15 were permitted an increase, while 6 were refused any increase. Mr Alistair, for supplementary. I look forward to perusing the detail, but could I raise with the Minister the some of the heartless decisions taken by his department in relation to very obvious need for temporary variations. I think of a young child who wanted to attend Kilcrow Primary School, eldest of a family, nearest primary school, no obvious means of getting anywhere else, refused because places filled by students who'd passed, uh, who attended there from much further afield 
for whom it wasn't their nearest primary school. Yet when the department is asked to allow a single increase, which would have kept the composite class at only 28, the minister refuses. Why has there been this heartless attitude to young children in this system? Well, I'm, I'm reluctant to debate or discuss an issue which I haven't got the details in front of me of. Uh, but the member perhaps answered his own question in the sense that he said the school have accepted pupils who have travelled past their nearest school. I suggest the member goes away and looks at the Pacific Schools entry criteria. The Board of Governors sets the entry criteria for any school. So perhaps, perhaps the member may have a valid point, and I will look into the matter further after question time. The member may have a valid point, but certainly I, I would point him in the direction of looking at the particular school's entry criteria in this instance. Well, Mr. Danny Kennedy. Thank the Minister for his, uh, for his answers. Can I ask the Minister to outline uh, how many and in which cases he personally intervened to grant additional places to a school via the temporary variation process and in the process overturned the recommendation of his own officials? Well, uh, uh, the member used to be a minister and uh, he will be aware, therefore, that officials' role is to give the minister advice. Now, perhaps in DRD, the officials ran DRD, though I suspect, looking at some of the cases, that would not be the case, because officials would have more experience than to achieve what the minister achieved in his time in DRD. I am more than happy to provide the information the member requests. I do not have it at hand, Deputy Speaker, but I will provide it to him. Call Mr. John Dalek. Principal Deputy Speaker, question number six. The level of stress related illness amongst teachers is higher than I, as Minister of Education, would want to see, and therefore I take the issue extremely seriously. My department, in conjunction with the employing authorities and the teaching unions through the Teachers Negotiation Committee, continue to work together to tackle this issue. Some examples of what we are doing on a practical level include a strategy for teacher health and well-being, a policy statement on tackling violence and abuse against teachers, a workload agreement, a teacher attendance procedure which includes a new provision for the recording of incidences of work-related stress, flexible working scheme, job share scheme, career break scheme, temporary variation of contract, and a policy statement on planning, preparation and assessment time. However, it is also important to recognise that what is reported as stress-related illness is not necessarily as a result of the work environment. To set the context, in 2014-15, 21% of all absence was reported as stress-related, and of this, 37 was reported as work-related stress. Notwithstanding this, I want to assure members that this is a matter of the utmost importance to me and my department. Most recently, I have personally endorsed the reinvigoration of the Teachers' Health and Wellbeing Working Group, where work-related stress absence is the prime issue. Mr. Dallet, first supplementary. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for his answer. And I just wonder, has the Health and Wellbeing Project, is that being pursued? And perhaps more importantly, is the Minister aware that teachers who stay in the profession until their 60s have a remarkably short life expectancy? and now don't have the opportunity to retire earlier, as they may have done in the past. Is this something that the Department has taken seriously, given that those people dedicated their whole lives to the teaching profession? Well, in the first instance, in relation to the member, I have reinvigorated the Health and Wellbeing Working Group. I, I want to see product flowing from that group, and I will continue to monitor the progress made within that group. In relation to uh, the stress levels on teachers, <laughs> teaching, as the member will be aware, is a, is a very rewarding profession uh, in many, many different aspects. But yes, it does come with levels of stress uh, associated with it. And our job, and my job as minister, and the job of employees is to ensure that stress managed is level, is managed, and that it doesn't affect the overall health and well-being of, of the teacher. And that's what we're attempting to do. In relation to retirement age, that has been much debated within this chamber and elsewhere, and changes made to that uh, have put severe restrictions on the ability of the executive 
to mitigate against that. We're talking significant amounts of money to, for either the Department of Education or indeed other departments uh, to bring in an alternative scheme. However, I am looking at alternatives. I am investigating uh, the use of funds to see if we can facilitate earlier retirement uh, for some of our teaching colleagues who may want that to be the case. I'm going through those details with my officials now. I will have to bring that matter to DFP, as would be the usual case, nothing to do with any new gatekeeping role people have been self-appointed to. I would also then have to bring it to the executive as well in the future, but I can assure the member I am investigating alternatives. Oh, Mr. Sean Lynch. Can I ask the Minister what actions his department has taken to tackle bullying and harassment of teachers? Well, again, it is a responsibility, primarily a responsibility of the employing authorities and the employers of the teacher. But since in 2011, my department, in collaboration with employing authorities and teachers' unions, agreed a teachers' health, well, health and wellbeing strategy. This strategy has been recently been reviewed, and I am aware that the recommendations relating to the strategy are being considered through the Teachers' Negotiating Committee, at which my department and employers are obviously represented. Most recently, as I have said to Mr Dallet, I have reinvigorated the Teachers' Health and Wellbeing Working Group, and as I say, I want to see product flowing from that working group as well. Oh, Mr Phil Flanagan. Uh, the Irish League of Credit Unions recently published a report which highlights the cost of parents sending children to school. In particular, it suggests that school uniforms are the most expensive items to purchase. To assist parents with sending children to school, my department provides significant funding through a range of supporting measures, for example, free school meals, the clothing or uniform allowance scheme, and we providing assistance with transport. At this time of year, I recognise that school uniform costs are of particular concern to parents. Whilst my department provides assistance allocating over £5 million of funding through the Clothing Allowance Scheme, I believe that some schools could do more to ensure their uniform policy is fair and reasonable in both practical and financial terms. My department has issued guidance to schools on school uniform policy. The guidance makes it very clear that DE expects Board of Governors to give a high priority to cost considerations when deciding on what uniforms their pupils should wear. I would therefore encourage schools to consider whether their current arrangements are in the best interest of children and their family circumstances and change them if they are not. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware of the growing concern that many people have about the cost of sending their children back to school, particularly with uniforms. But some schools are also charging up to £100 in my area for a voluntary contribution to send their child to a school. Can I ask the Minister for um, his department's position on those voluntary contributions, um, which uh, adds to the, the growing financial pressures that parents have in sending their children back to school? Uh, well, under current legislation, all schools may seek a voluntary contribution from parents for the benefit of the school or in support of activities organised by the school. However, the department requires that any request for a voluntary contribution from a school must make it clear that there is no obligation for parents to make the contribution and that pupils will not be treated differently according to whether or not their parents have made the contribution. So the, the clause in the title is voluntary. Uh, parents do not have to make the contribution. I, I appreciate that schools raise funds in many, many different ways. There's pressures on school budgets, but there's also pressures on family budgets as well. So I would ask any school who are seeking voluntary contributions to think about it carefully and at what level they're setting it at and ensure the parents know that it is a voluntary contribution. Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney. Question number nine, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am content that the statementing process is designed to meet the individual special educational needs of children, including those with autism spectrum disorder. The process is child centred to ensure that children have ac access to an appropriate education that affords them the opportunity to achieve their personal potential in terms of age and ability, aptitude and any special educational needs they may have. It is in the interest of all concerned that statutory assessment and statements are made as quickly as possible, having regard to the need for the thorough consideration of the issues in individual cases. Following receipt of a request for statutory assessment of a child's special educational needs, 
The Education Authority is required under legislation to complete this process in no more than 26 weeks, subject to valid exceptions. This period of time allows for detailed assessments to be undertaken, with input commission from the child's parents or guardians and a range of educational health professionals, if appropriate. All of the former education library boards have recently reported that the majority of cases this statutory target is being met, subject to valid exceptions. I will continue to